Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us in this panel on air pollution and the immune system. Uh, can we have the presentation on, please? Okay. So we have an excellent panel of discussions that will update us on the recent epidemiological evidence on uh, respiratory infections, including COVID-19. And then we'll deep dive, deep dive deeper into the impacts on the immune system and uh, conclude the panel with a focus on the children's immune system. And then uh, the logistics pretty much follow what has already been done. We have 15 minutes talks followed by five minutes questions and answers. And we have reserved a 15 minutes time allocation for a general discussion at the end of the session. So we'll see how this works out. As a short discussion, epidemiological uh, introduction into the session today, uh, epidemiological evidence on the uh, effects of air pollution on respiratory infection is growing. In these slides, you may see the results of a meta-analysis uh, showing that short-term exposure to PM2.5 or NO2 increases uh, hospitalizations for pneumonia by 1% and 3% correspondingly. Now, understanding how uh, air pollution affects the immune system is vital in understanding uh, uh, how pollution causes disease, and this will also address new ideas on how we can deal with the health effects of air pollution. Studies have shown that air pollution causes uh, pro-inflammatory immune responses across multiple classes of immune cells, mainly by enhancing adaptive immune responses or deregulating antiviral immune responses. This is a picture, I believe it's from a work done by Professor uh, Jaspers, that shows, for example, the interaction between air pollutant, one air pollutant inhalation with uh, COVID-19, but the general mecha mechanisms may be applied and generalizable to other infections, such as, for example, the virus of pneumonia. So controlled exposure studies indicate that inhaled pollutants can affect host defense response to viral infections in multiple ways, and the figure shows at least six different paths of possible mechanisms by impairing different uh, processes of the immune system. For example, in the circle three, we can see that in pairs, intercellular pathway activation, or under circle six, it impairs immune cell, immune cell functions. Although our session is, uh, hardly fo is mainly focused on respiratory disease, air pollution also affects the wider immune system, for example, in the neonatal and ga gastrointestinal tract. So I would uh, ask you to keep this in mind, and. Uh, I will be pleased to present our first speaker for today in order to move on with uh, the interesting discussions. Our first speaker for today is uh, Professor Francesc Francesco Forastiere. He is currently a visiting professor at Imperial College in London. He has served for many years as a public health officer at the Department of Epidemiology of the Lazio region in Rome. He has a medical background in respiratory and occupational medicine and a PhD in epidemiology. He has focused on the application of innovative scientific research methods, including health impact assessment, to a wide range of public health issues, including air pollution, radon, waste disposal, occupational exposure to silica and asbestos, environmental tobacco smoke, and more recently on COVID-19. So, Professor, first here, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks, Abby. Thanks, Ivan, and uh, I have to thank HCI for this invitation. It's very nice to be here for this session, which is a mixture of different disciplines, and, uh, and this makes uh, more interesting, I think. So a few days ago, I was speaking with a friend of mine uh, about the title of my presentation, and he said, okay, you are uh, addressing one popular issue, viral infection. So are you uh, speaking on why we get the viral infection during the cold month? Uh, I said, no, I'm not addressing this. You know, this is an important question. Are you addressing the question how to distinguish between the viral and bacterial infections? Oh, I said, no, this is not my topic of today. 
But, you know, uh, uh, virus and bacteria, they cause the uh, respiratory infections. So the real cause are virus and bacteria. Well, what's the role of air pollution there? And I think, yes, this is the, uh, uh, the aim of my, my uh, presentation today. So uh, with this in mind, uh, just some recap, especially for, you, for some of you not with a medical background. When we speak about acute lower respiratory infections, we include pneumonia, of course, which is infection of the lung alveoli, but also infections affecting the airways, such as bronchitis, and bronchiolitis in infants and very young children. And these conditions are leading causes of illness and death worldwide, both in children and in the elderly. So it's a large public health issue. Some notes in a nutshell about uh, lower respiratory infections. I don't have references here, but uh, you know you should believe me on these statements. And uh, um, uh, but uh, you know I, ca I can provide some uh, uh, some references for this. Uh, usually, respiratory infections are caused by virus. There are plenty of virus nowadays. Also, the coronary coronavirus arrive, but also bacteria. The most frequent uh, bacteria is Streptococcus pneumonia, but also Haemophilus influenza and other. The key aspect is the equilibrium between the virome and the microbiome, so the amount, the, the type of virus and, and bacteria that we have, and the host factor. And of course, the immune system can alter this equilibrium. But there's also another crucial uh, factor that is important, which is chronic mucus hypersecretion. And so chronic mucus abris secretion is a risk factor for viral and bacterial infection. So this is an explanation why viral infection is the precipitating factor for exacerbation of both asthma and COPD. So when we speak in air pollution epidemiology of exacerbation of asthma, exacerbation of COPD, we are speaking about viral infections. So the story is the virus promote the uh, uh, pro-inflammatory mucosal response that accelerate the growth of pathogens like bacteria. So that's why the process is, is that very often we have first the viral infection and then we have the complication, the so-called complication of bacterial infection. That's why when you go to the doctor, you said I have a cold, and should I take the antibiotics? And the doctor said, no, 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 let's wait. And then after three days, you get the antibiotics. That's the story. Uh, but it's very simplified. Okay, so uh, as any epidemiology, everything starts in London. Starts in London either with John Snow, uh, but for the air pollution epidemiology start with the London smog in, in December 1952. What's peculiar in that episode that mortality from pneumonia was increased threefold during the smog days, but also incidence of pneumonia was increased. But the interesting story was not increased only during the smog events, was also increased more during the following weeks. So there is a lag time between the smog events and the incidence of uh, the disease. And you notice here, this report is from Logan in 1952 in the Lancet, but there are two, um, two names that are related to studies on the London smog, Waller and Lothar. And there is an interesting uh, study that I found in 1952. This is the first panel study was published in 1952, is a, is a panel study of 180 patients with, at that time, chronic bronchitis. Nowadays, we call uh, COPD. What they did, they followed them every day, together with measurement of uh, smoke uh, at the hospital, and they found a very close correlation between the level, the concentration of smoke, and the uh, status, the, the uh, respiratory tract status of, of the patients. And in the paper, what they say is this is possibly due to infections, and they speak about bacterial infections, but also viral infection. So this is very interesting. So the story goes back 
to London in 1952 and 1957. And the same authors you see Lothar in the in the in, in, in the um, in the left uh, part of the slide. So he published in 1969 an experimental study showing that exposure in, uh, in, uh, in vitro exposure of, uh, uh, of pollutants increased the growth of hemophilus influenza. So the idea was at that time that exposure to air pollution can increase the growth of the bacteria. But this was not an odd idea. This has been also confirmed in a scientific report in 2020 that urban particles increase the colonization of streptococcal pneumonia, the uh, colonization of epithelial cells, and the transit to, uh, to the lung. So in sum, how air pollution could work? Could work with at bacterial level, enhance bacterial growth and colonization, at the level of the airways, because cause pulmonary uh, oxidative damage and inflammation, damage of the mucosal system, suppress alveolar macrophage uh, uptake, impairs microbial clearance, and enhance pneumococcal adherence to airways epithelial cells, but also can act on the immune system, which is the topic of today, increase susceptibility to both bacteria and, uh, and, uh, and virus. So let's see very briefly what's the, uh, what are the results of the epidemiological studies and what kind of systematic review. And first of all, let's look at long-term exposure and pneumonia in children. And it's very surprising. There is a systematic review going back to 2013, only four studies uh, indicating an association between PM 2.5 exposure and, uh, and um, incidence of pneumonia in children. There are no more systematic review. This is a pity. But uh, on the right side, you see th this, this is said a lot study. But you know, there are too many studies that Europeans are doing. This is not a lapse. This is a scape study. Sorry, this is my mistake. And it's a, 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 a pool analysis of 10 European birth court showing an association between pneumonia in children and, and several pollutants. The, the effect of uh, PM 2.5 was large, but was not statistically significant. This is pneumonia in children, long-term exposure. And uh, if you go to the traffic review, HCI traffic review that Anna Bogart presented today, we said in that report that is the science of the evidence for a, a traffic related pollution and lower respiratory infections it is moderate to high, and this is because of the meta analysis for NO2 that you see in this slide, but also this is based on supporting evidence from elemental carbon and also studies based on the indirect measure of uh, uh, traffic related air pollution. Uh, what about long term exposure uh, to air pollution and pneumonia in adults? Again, there is, here there is no systematic review, few studies on hospitalization. The most important one is the, is the Medicare court. The study was published in 2019, and it's related to PM 2.5. But if we go back, there is a large case control study in Canada, in Ontario, also showing an association with pneumonia in adults. And more recently, there is, this time is the LAP study, uh, indicating a relationship between NO2 and pneumonia mortality. Uh, we go to short-term exposure, and uh, we have a systematic review on the exposure in, uh, in children, and uh, this systematic review was published in 2017, and you, sh you see for the overall effect of PM 2.5 based on 13 studies, the relationship is strong there, but also with NO2 with 12 studies. And for adults, this is the slide that Evi Samoli already presented. Uh, the evidence is very strong for both PM2.5 and, and for NO2. Uh, but one interesting observation is the lag time of the effects. Most of the studies have looked a lag time of up to six days. And you see here, for most of the association, the relationship is maximum at six days. But the study was not able to address more days. 
So, so the indication is that there is time between the exposure and the, the frank uh, manifestation of disease. There is some time that elapses. And there is an interesting observation on bronchiolitis. This is a, a large case crossover study conducted in Utah and published in the Blue Journal in, uh, in 2018. And uh, this is bronchiolitis in infants, and uh, they were able to characterize the, the virus for the bronchiolitis, either the uh, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, RSV, or the flu. Uh, and they saw that the largest effect was a three-week. So basically, the, the, the relevant effect occurred three weeks before the appearance and, and the, the emergency room visits. So there is a lot of time, and this is quite interesting because the incubation period for RSV is only five, five days. So this is an indication is that air pollution exposure precede the infection. So in a way, this is a clearly indicating that is, uh, the air pollution inf uh, exposure increased the susceptibility to infections. But not only susceptibility, I think this is an important study in The Lancet in 2003, indicating that for virus-induced, uh, uh, severity of vi virus-induced asthma in, in, in children, this is a panel study, is very much related to NO2. NO2 exposure increased the severity of the viral infections in, in asthmatic children, and this is particularly true for RSV um, uh, kind of infection. And this is important because we saw susceptibility, but we, saw, we see also here uh, severity. Uh, now, uh, one part of my presentation is related to COVID-19. Of course, this is an important issue. Has been, the discussion has been going on during 2020, especially because of the uh, ecological studies. I think it's important to refer to this report by Imperial College in 2021. Uh, Ada Walton was the first author, but also Claire Kansuyane is among the authors here. And uh, what the report says, says that there is some possibility that both long-term and short-term exposure could increase incidence and severity of COVID-19, but the early ecological studies were useful to generate hypotheses, but there are too many methodological uh, limitations and problems. Studies at that time were unclear if air pollution increased the risk of infections, but the studies at that time were indicating that the risk of hospitalization in people already infected with COVID-19 may be uh, present. And I did a very fast check of the recent individual studies on air pollution and COVID-19 severity. And I list here four, uh, but of course, yesterday and today, there are two excellent posters presented. One of the court study in, uh, in Denmark and in Copenhagen, and the second is the, 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 uh, from uh, Zorana Andersen, and uh, the second is the presentation from uh, Mike uh, Jarrett on, uh, on Southern California, indicating clearly there is a no relationship with uh, severity. So this uh, quick review is about studies published in 2021. Uh, the first is among US uh, veterans. The second is uh, subjects in Catalonia, Spain. The third in is, uh, is among subjects in New York City. And the last one is a paper which is in press from the Rome Longitudinal Court. And uh, these studies did not find an effect on incidence, but actually found an effect on mortality and on uh, ICU uh, admission. Uh, it's interesting that uh, there are few well-done studies on short-term exposure. I think the most important one is this one from Alberto and Ontario in Canada. And this is showing an effect of PM2.5 and NO2 on uh, 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 emergency room visits for uh, COVID-19, and the effect was much stronger for those visits that follow with an hospitalization, clearly indicating that severity is the, is the key aspect of this relationship. 
So to sum up, there is strong evidence that both long and short-term exposure of air pollution are associated with incidence of acute lower respiratory infections. There is suggestive evidence that both long and short-term exposure are related also to severe form of COVID-19. There is a need for studies that uh, address susceptibility to infections, severity of, of disease progression, and also, this is a new topic in the vaccine period area, is how much the vaccine efficacy, efficacy is impaired by air pollution. This is something for the next generation of studies. So what's the future? Uh, there was already an editorial in 2003, uh, and, and the editorial said the challenge remained to discover the mechanism that drive effect, such effects of air pollution on respiratory infections. The future for me uh, today is to combine chron chronic disease epidemiology with infectious disease epidemiology. They have different methods and it's time to combine them. Set large population court studies to detect infections. Combine information from epi stu and mechanistic studies on virus pollutant interaction. Use the lab much more than before to assess the nature of the infection and the immune status of the population and discover new study design to evaluate the effect on transmission, severity, and vaccine efficacy. And with that, I thank you for the attention. So thank you, Francesco. We'll uh, take a couple of quick questions. We have a couple of minutes. Please introduce yourself as you're asking a question. Hello, Elizabeth Chan, EPA, thanks for that. Um, I was just wondering if you had any theories on the mechanism, is, it su is COVID suppressing the immune system? Is it, um, are there any ideas on how, why that you're seeing these effects? Yeah, they uh, published at least 10 uh, review papers suggesting different theories. So I don't think I have a theory because I'm not in the mechanism area, but I refer to this uh, uh, review and, uh, and maybe somebody else could address this. <laughs> uh, Francesco, uh, one question that I had on temporality between infection and uh, uh, exacerbation of uh, respiratory disease. Well, air quality impacts everyone, but viral infections are cluster-based. So how much trust do you have in actually these relationships because the um, you know, the populations are not of equal size. Yeah, I, I think we had uh, in, enough studies showing uh, an association even with uh, these differences. So, so the, cos the, the consistency of the finding, I think, speak for a positive uh, relationship. Any questions online? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Let's thank Francesca one more time. It is my privilege to uh, introduce one of my fellow toxicologists, Dr. Lona Jaspers, who's a professor and director of the curriculum in toxicology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where she also directs the Center for Environmental Medicine, Asthma, and Lung Biology in the uh, College of Medicine. Her lab really leads the way in a lot of translational research. Uh, she's collaborating with a number of uh, folks at the Office of Research and Development at US EPA. Her lab is developing a number of in vitro and clinical models to address the linkages between air pollution and infectious disease. And it's a privilege for us to have Dr. Jaspers here uh, give her remarks. Thank you, Lona. Thank you. Thank you for the great introduction, and thank you for inviting me to come here. And, and Francesco, thank you for setting me up for you. I mean, this, I could have not done this any better, so thank you for that. Um, so um, what I'm going to try to do in the next 15 minutes or so is give you a couple of examples of potential interactions and potential mechanisms mediating the, me mediating the way how air pollutants could enhance viral infections in humans. Let's see how this works. Okay, um, this is just real quick, and, and I think some of this was already covered in the previous talk. This is really more sort of philosophically looking at the interaction between air pollutants and viruses. Why do we even think that they should be interacting? Well, first of all, we, we breathe in you know, a pool full of air every day, and this air is not only containing air pollutants, but it's also containing viral particles. 
We are all now, you know, experts on aerosol transmission and you know aerosol size. I mean, COVID has really sort of brought the the um, aerosol um, chemistry and everything to the forefront. And of course, they contain both. Uh, so we're not breathing in just pure air or pure air pollutants or pure virus containing aerosols. They're in a mixture. They really target the same tissue. We've all learned now more about where COVID-19 infects, and the same tissue is also attacked by inhaled air pollutants. So the target is also a, a, a location for interaction. And one thing that I will sort of go in a little bit more in the next couple of slides is they really rely on similar immune and host de defense uh, functions and reactions. When we're talking about uh, effects of air pollutants, we often talk about inflammation, we talk about lung injury, things like that. And the same thing is what viruses do and, and bacteria do. So the, the, the effects, the tissue and the targets are really similar. So they're prone for, for interaction. This is, I'm gonna go through this very, very quickly because a lot of this was already covered and um, there's more and more data coming out every day. I looked at some of the great posters yesterday and today looking at the interaction between COVID-19 and air pollutants. But one thing that I wanna point out is this is not the first time we have SARS. And actually the first outbreak of SARS in 2002 already showed, and that was much more localized, already showed an interaction between air pollution and the SARS um, uh, outbreak in, that particular, in these particular locations. So I'm not gonna go much into, uh, more into this, but there's more and more studies coming out every day, really forming, a, uh, really forming the, the, or uh, supporting the hypothesis that there's a clear interaction between air pollution and COVID-19, incidence, severity, and probably mortality as well. And this was already introduced earlier on um, in the introduction here. And this is, this is a schematic that we put together in a review article. And it really just outlines, this is just for SARS-CoV-2, uh, but very similarly, um, influenza works very, very similarly. So let me see whether I can use this pointer here. Um, so we have all become very familiar with ACE2. The ACE2 is the receptor to which um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds. It actually needs to be proteolytically activated. What does that mean? The virus actually takes advantage of host proteases, cleavage enzymes, because it actually needs to be cleaved before it can actually enter the host cell. That's also why um, in viruses like influenza and um, SARS, uh, are predominantly pneumotropic because these enzymes are highly expressed in the epithelial layer covering the respiratory tract. So upon activation, it then goes into the cell. It actually gets uh, uncoded and activated. It actually activates um, a toll-like receptor um, uh, pathway. I'm not gonna go into that. It actually, um, it then induces a large number of gene expression profiles. I will get into that in a little bit later. But it can also impair antiviral immune signaling. We've all heard about interferons by now. So it can actually suppress interferon uh, signaling or or antiviral host response signaling. I'll get into that in a little bit later. And this will then lead into an impaired cellular immune response. We've all heard about you know, macrophages and neutrophils and T cells and you know, natural killer cells and all of these cells we've all read in the mainstream media now in the context of COVID-19. And air pollutants, even in the absence of these viral infections, affect each and every one of these steps here. So it's prone for, for multiple targets of interaction between inhaled air pollutants and viral infections. So I'm gonna go first into this first step, uh, which is basically why the virus is so well equipped in infecting all of our noses because these enzymes right here, TMPRSS2 and other proteases are highly expressed in the nasal mucosa. So I'm gonna go into that first. So there are many um, previous studies, and we've actually done some of those way before we even talked about COVID-19, uh, looking at the proteolytic activation of these viruses. Again, SARS, uh, these um, coronaviruses, um, uh, influenza viruses, and mad pneumoviruses are really re relying on the ability of um, these cells to, these target cells to actually activate the virus. The virus itself is not active. So there's many other studies that actually look at the interaction between 
uh, pollutants like diesel exhaust, um, as well as other um, um, aryl hydrocarbon activating um, air toxicants. We actually did some studies a few years ago looking at ozone, which also activates these proteolytic enzymes. So even in the absence of, of a virus, you're activating these, these enzymes that really make it more suitable for a virus to come in and infect the cell. So we've actually developed, this is an essay that um, a graduate student in my lab um, has developed. Because one of the things we want to do is can we screen potential pollutants, potential toxicants, potential exposures, whether or not they actually are, have the potential to increase these viral infections. So what she has developed here, I'm not going to go into the really nitty gritty uh, chemical um, analysis here, but it's very basically an assay that could be made into high throughput activation where you basically screen a number of different chemicals to which you could be exposed to through inhalation uh, routes and whether or not they can activate the virus or not. So using this, what we've done, or what she's done, the royal we, uh, we use nasal epithelial cells from human volunteers. We get these uh, routinely in my lab. Uh, we then fully differentiate them to cells so they look exactly like what they look like in the nose. And then we actually expose them to various different pollutants. In this particular study, we started out with diesel exhaust as well as two forms of wood smoke particles, oak as well as eucalyptus, sort of representing the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States. And so we basically expose these cells to these um, wood smoke or to these air pollution um, um, particles and then collected the apical or the, the, the basically the, the wash or the surface of the cells afterwards. This is the surface where these proteases would be and this is basically the space where the virus would interact with the cells. And what we found was that these, um, once the cells were exposed to these pollutants, you actually have an increase in the proteolytic cleavage of these SARS viruses. The nice thing about this assay is because we're also now all very familiar with all of the different variants, the alpha strain, delta, omicron, and now the B4, which seems to be evading um, all of the vaccines and prior infection. We can actually modify the assay and the peptide uh, to whatever is circulating right now, and that's, that can be a pretty quick turnaround. So we can actually even look at various strains and susceptibility or enhanced activation of various strains by uh, specific pollutants. So going back to this, um, of course, there's many, many other interactions, but I, I only want to go into one more in the sort of more mechanistic studies before I go into our, in our uh, in vivo studies. And this is really the impaired um, innate immune um, gene expression profiles here, which really are orchestrating the host defense response. And this is, again, similar outline that I just showed you. We use these nasal epithelial cells from both male and female uh, donors, and this is very important. I'll show you why in a second. Again, we differentiate them and we expose them to different air pollution, mixtures, diesel exhaust particles, wood smoke, uh, eucalyptus. We've now done this also with mixtures that represent military burn pits, uh, that represent uh, um, uh, uh, particle samples from China as well as many others. And then we're uh, treating our cells with those, infecting them with the virus, and looking for virus-induced gene expression or the interaction between the pollutant and the virus anywhere from 24 to 72 uh, two hours afterwards. And um, as expected, we actually get a nice increase in uh, viral particle release. And our SARS-CoV-2 infection actually does what it's supposed to do. It really nicely upregulates all of those interferon, all of these antiviral host defense genes that you want. This is, this is very much what's already published in the literature. So we're just basically opt validating what's already out there. But what was interesting in our system was when we pretreated our cells with these wood smoke particles, particularly the, the ones from red oak uh, that was burnt from red oak, uh, what we saw was a significant suppression of many of these really critical key genes. And what was even more exciting to us was that a lot of these um, immunosuppression of the wood smoke particles was more pronounced in cells from females as compared to male donors. So there seems to be a sex difference in terms of whether or not and to what extent there's an interaction between air pollution and viral infections. <laughs> 
So basically, just to summarize here, what we found was that these red oak uh, wood smoke particles really suppress the uh, SARS-CoV-2-induced antiviral host gene uh, or immune response, at least in this um, nasal in vitro model. And this was recently published. So we also have um, developed a human in vivo model, obviously not to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we're actually looking at some of the vaccine efficacies now, but that's for a later time. But we've done many years studies using an in vivo model of human influenza infections. And what we do is we take advantage of what is actually um, approved, FDA approved, um, and this is called Flumist, or Life Attenuated Influenza LIV vaccine. And as the name says, it's a life attenuated virus. What it is, it's cold adapted, so it can only replicate in the nose. It does not travel to the lower respiratory tract. It's limited to 32 degrees Celsius. Your lung is about 37. So everything occurs only in the nose. But what it does, it actually generates a replicative and self-limited infection, similar to what you would get from an influenza infection, a community-acquired influenza infection, just much more attenuated, and everything is located to the nose. The virus is not able to replicate in the lower respiratory tract. So we've used this model now for over a decade, and it really provides a nice, safe tool to study in a controlled way influenza infections in humans in vivo and looking at the interaction between controlled exposures and influenza infections in humans in vivo. So again, it does not go to the lower respiratory tract and sort of uh, because it actually limits everything to the nose, the nose is a great accessible organ and we can sample a lot. We can get a lot out of the nose and actually sample serially these human volunteers and get a lot, a lot of data and a lot of uh, biological samples out of these human volunteers. So we've done this many times, um, many different models. We've looked at it in cigarette smokers and e-cigarette users, but I'm just gonna sh focus on this particular study here um, that we published um, a few years ago where we looked at a model pollutant and wood smoke. Um, I don't have to tell this audience the threat of wildfire smoke and wood smoke in the United States and globally. There's always some country or some state or some area in the world on fire. Uh, as you can see, these are pictures from San Francisco. And, but one thing that I wanted to point out here on the bottom left you see what we use in the human uh, studies facility at the EPA. We use kiln-dried red oak, so this is pristine red oak, and really this sort of nice, cozy wood smoke, uh, wood burning stove. And the wood burning stove uh, generates a nice controlled uh, smoke exposure, and that gets funneled into an exposure chamber, very controlled, at about 500 micrograms per cubic meter. So we use this and we've done this sort of protocol several years now uh, for, for several years. Obviously COVID put a big damper, so we have a gap of about two and a half years now, but we're back on to studying and, and using the wood smoke exposure studies. So we're using healthy, otherwise healthy volunteers. They're being exposed to 500 micrograms per cubic meter of wood smoke. It's about relevant to, you know, when, you, when you're actually in these wildfires, it's much higher than that. So we're not exposing them to anything that is unrealistic. It makes the entire building smell like a campfire. And then following the wood smoke exposure, we inoculate them with LAIV. And what we found right away was that the LAIV actually causes a suppression of CXCL10 or IP10, which is a critical uh, chemokine that orchestrates a lot, a lot of the antiviral host defense responses. But one thing that was very frustrating in the beginning, we had these data for many, many years, and this is, was, was the only thing that really stood out. We've done everything. We've done gene expression profiles, we've done cytokine analysis, everything. Um, and nothing really popped up until a postdoc at the time in my lab, Dr. Megan Rabuli, she's now an assistant professor at UNC, looked at these data and then actually stratified them uh, by males and females. Thankfully, we had about the same number of males and females in each exposure group, and lo and behold, that's where it was. It really was basically the males and females almost like counteracted each other and the variability was so high so we didn't see anything. But when you actually analyze them individually, you saw significant responses and significant patterns here. 
So what we, what we saw was that there was an, a clear exposure by sex interaction, uh, and what we found was that males showed a significantly higher pro-inflammatory response, and females a much more suppressed host defense response. Similar to what we saw literally almost five, six years, actually more than that, seven years later in our in vitro model using the, wood, the oak wood smoke particles. And this was also published a couple of years ago. So, um, just to summarize real quick here, um, both our acute exposure and chronic exposures, the chronic exposure much more in the epidemiological literature, show that uh, pollutants, both particulate as well as gas phase. Um, I think in the previous talk we, we heard a lot more about NO2. I don't want to minimize the potential contribution of um, gas phase components. They definitely play a big role here as well. And uh, respiratory host defense responses. We all know that COVID-19 probably interacts with air pollutants in terms of the severity, uh, the incidence, and probably the mortality and morbidity caused by this virus. We have now developed several different organotypic uh, models using both nasal epithelial cells as bronchial epithelial cells, again, prime targets for these viruses, which allow us to really nicely manipulate and really understand potential interactions and, and mechanisms of these interactions. Um, and we also have the um, model of the LAIV, which allows us to then go into humans in vivo and also look at um, controlled exposures in the context of viral infections. And just to follow up on the previous speaker, I could not agree more with, uh, with you in terms of looking at vaccine responses and antibody responses. That is something that we're definitely pursuing uh, quite a bit now. So before I open up for question, I just want to really thank um, especially Stephanie Brook, who is the graduate student in my lab doing a lot of these studies, and Dr. Rabuli. She has now her own lab, uh, but was certainly instrumental. Um, Ian Gilmore and Young Ho Kim from the EPA. They're sort of my little pyromaniac, pyromaniacs. They sort of give me all of these sort of combustion-derived particles. Um, the study coordinators as well as uh, Dr. Mark Heise from UNC who allowed us to do the SARS-CoV-2 infection in his BSL-3 facility. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, we have about two minutes for questions. Uh, please walk up to the microphone and identify yourself. Eloise Maria, University College London. I was just curious if you had any speculations of why there's a difference in um, gender response. <laughs> How should I start? Um, so one of the things that we have actually published in a separate article beforehand is um, the baseline um, gene expression profile and the baseline sort of immune status of the nasal mucosas in males and females is, is significantly different. Um, so we actually did this when we, we developed a new model of a new sampling, very non-invasive sampling tool that, to basically sample the nasal mucosa. And we've done this early on and looked at a prototypic sort of pro-inflammatory chemokine interleukin-8. Um, and you can even look on an, on a, uh, an ELISA plate where you basically analyze these chemokines who whose sample came from a male and whose sample came from a female. There's, there's the differences in cytokine, chemokine, immune gene expression in the male and female mucosa are completely different. Uh, we're now getting ready to publish a paper. Uh, the nasal microbiome is significantly different in males and females. So, you know, and, and the entry route for all respiratory viruses is the nose. Um, so with the nasal mucosa being so different in males and females, I think that's where the difference comes from. Thank you so much, and uh, let's thank Dr. Jaspers again. Well, it's a treat for us to also have a, a physician scientist, a, um, you know, a, um, a real practitioner, uh, Dr. Karina Du from uh, Stanford University. She's a professor of medicine and pediatrics, and she's also uh, director of the Center for Allergy and Asthma Research, 
she's also a section chief in asthma and allergy in the pulmonary allergy and critical care division at Stanford Medicine. So, uh, you know, obviously she has a great perspective from both clinical side and mechanistic side. And it's uh, not surprising she's uh, been uh, sought after as an expert contributor to a number of uh, federal, state, and international agencies, and both her MD and PhD are from Harvard uh, Medical School. So, Dr. Nadu, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and really an honor and a privilege, and I'm excited to be able to speak to you today. I'll first talk about background and then ambient air pollution studies that we've been doing with a child cohort and then wildfires and uh, talk specifically how that affected a wild uh, child cohort with immune studies. And then finally, really facing on solutions research and having some policy-oriented outcomes. And I'm excited to be here with HEI that all of you are also involved in this research too. And then having a summary. So I was really excited to see the 2022 HEI report on giving a summary on immune changes among many other information that's in the report. I think studying this now and having it highlighted in the report uh, was really interesting to me because you can see this wonderful figure that was put in the recent report. And there are many arrows between each of these blocks. And my goal in my research lab is to figure out what is it, what's the mechanism that takes one block to the next? And why is that important? Why are these mechanistic studies in the framework of the immune system important? Well, number one, it helps validate the association epidemiological studies that are being done right now on air pollution exposure. And that can increase the impact and increase the level of criteria used for studies and what can be used in the future for scientific advancement. Number two, these types of studies and mechanistic work can help identify targets for therapy. And that's really important as we think about our new world with climate change being what it is, with air pollution changes being what it is. We need better therapies to help patients. Number three, can really help identify targets for prevention. We can think about ways to think ahead of time in terms of decreasing uh, specific disease risk. And number four, importantly, these types of markers that can be easily obtainable and looking at high throughput mechanisms by which to have these output measures, they could help us as prognostic markers as we change and implement policy, as we look at adaptation plans and mitigation plans for climate change and air pollution, these are the types of markers that could be easily potentially looked at in saliva, urine, or blood that we can then follow policy change and then look at whether or not that helped or did not and then benchmark that and then have an iterative process for allowing us to have better policy outcomes. So with that in mind, this is another figure that was put in the report. There's a lot known, there's a lot of evidence now, as Dr. Jaspers and others have mentioned, that diesel exhaust particles serve as an irritant for the epithelium. And that's nicely put here in this figure. And you can see those alveolar macrophage, for example, in our lungs. They first start out as monocytes in the blood. And then they are then matured and they become alveolar macrophage. And when they are activated, you can see all the different molecules that they can make. And that serves as even more inflammatory mediators that can increase mucus, can increase thickness around the lungs, and can lead to diseases like asthma. Importantly, you see the cells on the bottom of the slide. There are certain immune cells that are very important for enabling us to fight viruses, bacteria, fungi, and unfortunately, these are the very same cells that at the end of the road are being affected by air pollution. And not only just air pollution, but if you look at the concomitant application of allergens, and as you saw from Dr. Jasper's talk, also viruses, that increases the inflammation around the pathway. And why is that? Well, the epithelial barrier is very important to all of us. And anything that touches the air in our body is lined by epithelium. And when that barrier is disrupted, either by diesel exhaust pollutants or by certain detergents or by allergens or by viruses, then that creates an alarm in pathway. And it's very common for all of these toxicants to go through what we call in the immune system the alarm in pathway, like TSLP, you see it there. And then at the end of the road, T cells get activated and they can become dysfunctional. They can become allergic. There's other cells that I call the peacekeeper cells, like regulatory T cells, that can be modified over time to help decrease this likelihood. But engaging pollutants likely increases 
the pathology of Th2 and other cells that lead to allergies and asthma. So we think that some of these mechanisms that are occurring here, and you see a lot of different cells here, a lot of different features that they're making, all the interleukins, but why does that happen? Well, we think that one of the mechanisms could be epigenetic changes. And what do I mean by epigenetic changes? Well, that is the study of changes in gene function that are heritable and that do not entail a change directly in the DNA sequence. They're controlled by many different aspects in biochemistry, DNA modifications with methylation of CPG sequences, histone acetylation, but importantly, at the end of the day, they affect how our genes are either transcribed or translated, whether or not we make a product of protein or not. They can affect the function of cells very deeply and significantly. And so that's why we decided to study epigenetics. And when you look at the total genes that are affected by exposures, for example, tobacco smoke, farming, pollution, pet keeping, asthma, and atopy, there's a lot of overlap. So the genes that we're talking about in these diseases are exquisitely sensitive to environmental interplays. Nurture and nature are very much controlled by these two systems. And so I just want to outline, outline that in this table because you can see all of the red genes that are cooperatively shared between asthma, atopy, and a lot of environmental exposures. And that's through epigenetics. So we decided through a wonderful study that was done through the University of California in Berkeley and my colleague who's here, Dr. Uh, Fred Lerman in Sonoma Technologies, we looked at children in Fresno, California. And why did we choose Fresno? Well, there have been many studies already done by UC Berkeley showing that that was an area of California with high levels of pollution. And there was individual estimate exposure monitoring already available for families around Fresno. And the San Joaquin Valley, unfortunately, is uh, hit hard by air pollution as well as other agricultural greenhouse gases. And you can see the different addresses there on this map to show you the concentration of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, for example, in each of these families. And we wanted to study children because we know they can have a lifetime exposure. Many of the children in Fresno don't move away from Fresno, and so we really want to understand the lifetime exposure of air pollution in these families. Now what's also important to know is that in Fresno, California, compared to, let's say, the Bay Area where I live, where there's less air pollution exposure, the rate of allergies can be up to 70% of the population, both allergies and asthma. And it's also important to know that semi-volatile or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons like phenanthrene and naphthalene also are increased in the air around the Fresno area. And this has been published. So we started a Children's Environmental Health Center funded NIEHS and EPA funded study to be able to look at about 1,000 individuals collected in Fresno as well as in the San Joaquin Valley. We looked at spirometry and questionnaires. We collected blood, saliva, urine, and we looked at microbiota, and we collected blood, and then took plasma and PBMCs, peripheral blood mononucleosites that could be stored, and then looked at later with these high-dimensional omic type studies with CYTOF, which I'll show you in a second, proteomics, epigenetics, and different techniques that we could actu do, actually do single cell transcriptomics. And very importantly, we were able to find associations with individual estimate exposures thanks to the collaborative group. So here's the demographics of a cohort of children that I'll show you data on. There are about 121 non-asthmatic children in this study, about 67 asthmatic, and you can see that a lot of the children come from households with low socioeconomic status, a lot of them were Hispanic, and so we really want to understand that aspect of environmental justice when we, when we try to study the immune outcomes of environmental exposures. And this was published by my colleague, Dr. Mary Pernicki, in my laboratory in clinical epigenetics in 2018, showing the variability of the exposures. As you can see there, carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide and PM2.5, as you would predict, most high in the winter months, and then the ozone being most high in the summer months. And why do I show that? Well, that's because we also want to understand the methylation features of a certain gene, FOXP3, which is very important to me as an immunologist because when it is methylated, it reduces that peacekeeping cell 
allowing the Th2 inflammation and allergy to go unchecked. And what we wanted to understand is that time lag. How many days of exposure would you particularly need to be able to see a difference in the methylation of that gene? And we found that about 90 days exposure, we could see the most significant associations between this FOXP3 methylation and differences in pollution. And so we looked at that even further at a three-month versus six-month lag in the asthmatics versus the non-asthmatics. Again, this is a preliminary study. We continue to do this work together as a group. The asthmatic group is less than the non-asthmatic group, but it's important to see that there was some association between increased polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon concentrations and the changes in this FOXP3 methylation of this very important cell called the regulatory T cell. And many of my patients, as well as my colleagues in research, ask me, well, do these epigenetic changes stick? How sustained are they? And so for a group of willing participants who wanted to get their blood drawn again after uh, about uh, 260 or so days, you can see, compared to the initial visit, that there wasn't too much of a difference in the epigenetic profiles, and that's within the asthmatic and the non-asthmatic group. But again, this is very preliminary data. We need to continue to do these types of studies. So I talked about the CYTOF, and that's time of flight mass cytometry. That's a very special technique now that we can get over 47 different measurements at once in high dimensional immune profiling. And why is that important? Well, that means that through agnostic machine learning algorithms, we can try to go in and look at different immune functions that we might not have known were there with air pollution exposure. And so these are what we call VISNI maps, but they're, they're very similar to PCA plots. And so you can see within the lower PM2.5 column compared to the high PM2.5 column, that circled region of cell types, the monocytes, are increased in the exposure group for the high PM2.5. They're associated with a functionality of myeloperoxidase, which is also important because, again, we're trying to get to targets that we could try to give better therapies for or try to prevent. And then finally, C-reactive protein, which is a very common protein that we can test with high throughput mechanisms for hospital uh, assays, for example, was also increased in those that had higher PM2.5 levels. And then we also find IL-1 beta. And IL-1 beta is important because Dr. Jaspers mentioned the aryl hydrocarbon receptor is oftentimes a mediator for pollution, but we found that it was very high in those cells that had the aryl hydrocarbon receptor on their surface and that were monocytes. And why is that important? That's important because there are actually therapies for the IL-1 beta IL-1 beta pathway out there now that we could potentially use in patients to see if we can mitigate these effects of pollution. So we were studying these children for asthma effects and lung effects, as you know, as we studied the spirometry, but we were also getting other vital sign measurements, and we were very interested to see that the blood pressure changes over time, and these same children were occurring with our different panels of exposure analysis. And we found it interesting that systolic blood pressure was associated with increases in inflammatory cytokines, but also that the diastolic blood pressure in these children was associated with nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, but it was decreased in those exposed to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. We don't know quite exactly why that is, but the cardiovascular effects of pollution have been studied in other areas, of course, and what we're doing is trying to find this at the children level in the young ages to understand what's building up in their inflammation system that could potentially predispose them to cardiovascular issues. And what we very much were interested in finding was that monocyte population with aryl hydrocarbon receptor, and we found that it was increased in those children that had high amounts of blood pressure that were exposed to high amounts of air pollution. So we think that the monocyte population seems to be an important immune population to look at in air pollution-associated blood pressure increases in adolescents, and I think that we need to look at each of these different variables of pollutants to see how it affects the immune system over time. Finally, I'd like to just quickly mention wildfires and our studies on the immune system. As Dr. Jaspers mentioned, as what's been looked at here uh, at the conference, is wildfires don't seem to have any boundaries or season anymore, and unfortunately, much of the smoke circumnavigates the world in these large uh, wildfires. And with that, they, of course, have done some chemistry on wildfire smoke, 
they aren't in California at least wild anymore. Oftentimes they will incorporate commercial and residential buildings and so we're finding a lot of microplastics, toluene, styrene, dioxines, and uh, other toxic metals. And we looked at a small study and have published this with an N equals 42 control group and then 25 that were exposed. We age matched and sex matched these individuals. And you can see a large proportion were Hispanic. We looked again in the Fresno area. Many of them already had asthma. But at least preliminarily, we did see that after exposure to wildfire smoke, we're seeing similar markers. C-reactive protein increases, IL-1 beta increases as well. So again, we need to look at long-term effects, but at least we have some systematic way to try to gauge wildfire smoke exposures. I wanna leave on a good note, and that some of the regulations that thankfully HEI and the EPA have put into place, as well as California government, we switched buses, for example, to ultra-low sulfur diesel, and you can see there a decrease in a marker that was found with inflammation, and this is a surrogate for asthma, but you can see a decrease in children that were exposed to the ultra-low sulfur diesel buses. And this led, as well as much other evidence and our work in the Central Valley, to being able to talk to the town council and reduce exposures via changing now a zero emission bus policy uh, to fully electric buses in Fresno. So really excited about that. This picture is with our group in the high school there in local Fresno where they helped us with this logo, uh, with this logo and you probably recognize some of the people in this picture. So finally, possible solutions. It's really important to look at climate change, air pollution, and health effects. How can we best monitor? How should we best apply mechanistic science? My conclusions, I hope that many of you would agree that we need to do better exposure analysis on human samples using multi-omics, if that's feasible. Looking at effects of solutions and having policy-oriented outcomes with mitigation and adaptation plans, for example, studying before and after using a filter in the house, studying before and after uh, particular electrification of transportation occurs. We need multiple exposure composite uh, analyses to understand interactions. And then finally, we need to study longitudinal exposures over the course of a lifespan. And you can see the meta exposome picture I have there because this is complicated, but I think a group like HEI and the scientists and the researchers and the other groups in the room can do this. So I wanna thank you all for your attention and thank HEI. Please hold, we'll, we'll, we'll ask for questions, Kerry. Are there any questions? Uh, we do have a couple of minutes. So Kerry, I wanted to ask you, uh, this is very interesting that you presented a number of these kind of molecular epidemiology study designs, and as you noted, uh, they are you know, notoriously challenging and hence very small numbers. Uh, so can you perhaps uh, cover a little bit as to the, you know, how you are dealing with the challenges for multiple testing correction when especially you do omics, and then some of these uh, cohorts already have smokers, and so uh, there's a tremendous um, uh, number of confounding uh, factors to control for. So how do you solve that um, the challenge? Uh, first, we uh, thank you for that excellent question. We confound, use, we correct for the confounders with statistical methods that are classical, but then we also, through a bioinformatics approach, use an extremely difficult false discovery rate threshold. And so with those two in mind, we are really trying to decrease the risk of confounders, but of course, we can't completely exclude them. And so I think further testing is gonna be important. But it's good to see that some of these biomarkers don't have a range of error that would uh, make someone worried about needing huge sample sizes to be able to prove a significance in terms of an effect size measurement. Okay. Yeah. Hello, it's Catherine Pruitt from the American Lung Association. I have a very simple question for you. Can you um, describe uh, what the exposome is in your um, terminology? I haven't encountered it before and I love it. Oh, sure. Um, well, it's being used often, so if people uh, would argue with me, please feel free to stand up and let me know what your uh, understanding of it is. But from what I'm gathering from the literature as well, what I typically use in the vernacular uh, in air pollution research is that any one individual on this planet is exposed to a lot of different things through their diet, through their lifestyle, microbiome as well. Uh, 
and air pollution, as we've talked about a lot at this conference. So it's kind of the panoply of all the items that one can be exposed to in any moment in time as well as throughout their lifetime. And that's notwithstanding stress events, mental health issues, because I think in general we need to look at this one person, this one individual, and how it affects them. And so there are many different aspects of the exposome, and I think it has to be overlaid with predispositions and genetic predispositions as well. So I hope that helps you. Thank you, Dr. Nadu. Let's thank her for her presentation one more time. So we do have about 20 minutes or so for uh, a panel discussion. So again, please uh, make your way to the microphone for a question. Let me maybe start by uh, touching on some of the um, topics that cut across all of our presentations. Uh, Dr. Forestier uh, started by, um, or concluded by um, inviting more mechanistic understanding to address some of the challenges and inconsistencies in epidemiological studies. And both Dr. Nadu and Jaspers have elegantly shown how these can be studied. But I wanted to follow up maybe Dr. Jaspers to ask you um, first, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, even for mechanistic researchers understanding intricacies of the immune system response, what is up and what is down is sometimes nonlinear. So in your studies, you have shown that the sex differences and especially the wood smoke exposure actually suppress the response. Mm -hmm. So are you suggesting that it's actually good for uh, viral infection or bad for viral <laughs> infection? I just wanted to probe that so folks understand this better. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, get, I get that question quite often. Um, no, so, so there's a, there is a, the immune system is obviously a double-edged sword. So you want, you want to activate inflammation and immune responses in order to basically fight the invading pathogens. But then you also want to activate your resolution of your inflammation because if it stays there too long, you actually have, you know, it injures uh, non-specifically the surrounding tissue. Um, so if you have a, a, a lack of an activation early on, which I consider an, a, a suppressed antiviral host defense response, you cannot adequately respond to the invading pathogen. And that's what we've been seeing over and over again with our sort of mechanistics, so where you have, you know, whether it actually is an over-exuberant like inflammatory response, Possibly, but I'm not, that, that can or cannot be, you know, beneficial. But there's, over and over again, we've seen this sort of suppressed antiviral host defense response. Yeah, th so thank you. And again, this is going back to lack of induction. You know, to yeah. some, this may seem like, oh, this is a good thing, actually. And I, that's why I wanted to probe this uh, a little further so folks understand this. And Dr. Nadu, in, in your studies, do you see similar um, kind of, you know, uh, suppressant effects in the early response, and especially with your time course studies, or really it was only at the 90 day where you can see the association? It's a great question. You know, we've been studying responses to the COVID vaccine. We were studying responses to COVID as well as responses to air pollution. And so, and again, this is why it's so important to get a time course because you can initially see some uh, reductions in inflammation and then you see more of a chronic infiltration of inflammatory cells. And there are, me there are hundreds of different types of immune cells. And so it really matters which ones can uh, proliferate quickly versus which ones are the more memory cells, cells set that are gonna be there for many years. So I think it's gonna be very important to see this ebb and the flow of different immune cells and especially which tissues they're attracting and why they're causing these chronic changes in the lung, in the cardiovascular system, in the neurological system. And then, and then see to at what point there are irreversible changes. That's why these longitudinal studies are gonna be so important because at what point are we at a point of no return? And then we need to understand where that is and how to prevent it. And uh, Francesco, you know, you mentioned that the only evidence that's out there for um, you know, respiratory viruses is really very short term. So are there um, you know, opportunities for epidemiologists to perhaps follow you know, some of the cohorts or what are the needs and perhaps this is something that can be addressed in an editorial or something, you know, advising um, epidemiologists and bridging this gap between chronic disease and infectious disease epidemiology. Do you think that's one of the potential bridges is looking at time courses and actually synchronizing uh, the observations that are being made? 
Thanks, Stephen. I, yes, I, th I think we need more um, uh, epidemiology there on infections, but uh, we, we need to update our methods to do the studies. We need large courts, but we need also lab. You know, m many, many of the infections should be, most of the infections should be characterized, and this has not been done in, in the past. Um, and, and also the design of the study should be also uh, changed with respect to the traditional approach. And as I said in my, my last slide, we, we need to combine with uh, uh, infectious disease epidemiologist uh, uh, new, new methods. And, and I think the issue is so important nowadays, you know, if, if I can have the possibility to say, you know, we learned that we can prevent viral infections with social distancing. This is the, the lesson from the pandemic. Not only the, co the, the COVID-19 uh, the, the COVID virus, but you know, from experience in, 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 in England, we saw that uh, asthma admissions decreased a lot during the lockdown. And the reason why asthma admission decreased was because the human-to-human -human contacts were decreased and viral infections were decreased. So we know how to prevent viral infection. So the question is, and this is very provocative, to prevent the effects of air pollution shouldn't be simply to prevent the viral infections? <laughs> Well, let's, uh, let's put that in the parking lot and come back to it, but let's go to the audience, Ben. Sure, uh, Dan Krauss, Health Effects Institute. I just had a practical question for Dr. Jaspers. I was just curious, how difficult is it to get volunteers to participate in your high uh, wood-spoke exposure <laughs> chamber, and what kind of waiver do people have to sign to, uh, to participate in that? You know, actually the wood smoke studies are not that big of a deal. Um, so they were in that chamber for two hours. We actually asked them to bring a fresh change of clothing because it, it, it's really, I mean, it reeks. Uh, but, you know, getting them into the chamber, no, it's actually not that, not that difficult. Now, we've done many other studies, um, like intervention studies, where we actually had volunteers um, drink a shake of broccoli as an inter nutritional intervention. Now that was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the wood smoke studies is actually not that, not that big of a deal. Okay, thanks. It's amazing what a few bucks would do to college students, right? So. Um, Jeff Brook from University of Toronto and the HEI Research Committee. Uh, very interesting session. Thanks for hosting this one. So I'm curious about looking to you know other immune-related diseases and air pollution. No one really talked about that. You know whether you know it's um, you know uh, I don't know arthritis. You know there's association has been showing up with other diseases of that nature. Does anyone have any comments you want to add about about that broader role of air pollution or maybe other environmental exposure, but air pollution and, and you know affecting the immune system and then other diseases and sort of a broader umbrella under which maybe air pollution could be having fairly large systemic effects. I can try to answer first. So for, I, I think there have been um, attempted epidemiological studies around this in particular. I'd be interested in what others in the room have found through a lot of these cohort studies. But from what we have shown in the study that we're doing in Fresno, um, we are already seeing metabolic changes for these children. There's a lot of metabolic diseases now are coming out with, you know, you have to correct for confounders like obesity, but even withstanding that, we're seeing metabolic changes with air pollution exposure, and we think that's mediated by inflammation and by attack on insulin secreting cells, and that that's really important as we move forward with metabolic diseases, for example, in endocrinology. Um, I think that we need to understand more about the neuroimmunology axis. Um, there have been many studies showing that air pollution can affect cognition, of course, and mental health stress, but that needs to be looked at more carefully, too. We're just connecting up the dots now with uh, immunological changes that are affecting the neurological system with air pollution. And then finally, your question about arthritis and other autoimmune disease. I think we're still coming to that, too. There have been studies showing that air pollution enhances uh, rheumatoid arthritis or other uh, autoimmune diseases. But I'm not aware of any uh, studies that have shown that air pollution exposure induces those diseases. However, I, I might 
be wrong on that. Okay. Yeah, just to, as a confirmation to tell that we had a study published, I think, in 2017 on, uh, on people with different uh, um, autoimmune disease, including systemic sclerosis and uh, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. And we were looking at medication, and air pollution was related to increased use of medications um, for those diseases. So there is some evidence. Yeah, so I, I think also going back to what COVID has taught us, I mean, no virus before that at least I'm familiar with really caused the sort of brain fog that we're now seeing in long COVID and uh, basically elimination of taste and smell. And I mean, the olfactory bulb is right there, the olfactory nerves are right there. So looking at neurological um, effects of air pollutants is something that we really, really need to um, pay more attention to. And I could not agree more with, with uh, Dr. Nadu in terms of metabolic effects. We also see lipid metabolism di dysfunction uh, following even acute exposures. And these are sterols, oxysterols, and other sort of lipids that are systemically um, you know, just uh, dysregulated now. So. Um, yeah, I think I think there's there's lots of systemic um, diseases that that could be resulting either from the pollutants alone or the pollutant virus interaction. Hi, Anna Rule, Johns Hopkins University. Fascinating, really super interesting. Thank you. Um, I I you showed I think I don't I don't remember who showed. Um, there's that lag. At, at six days and it's still increasing. Um, and I may have missed it, but if, is there any hypothesis or maybe mechanistic studies showing how long of a lag we can expect or, or where to, how long to follow? Yes, th thanks if, for this question because it's an opportunity to underline the relevant issues. Um, unfortunately, in, in most of the short-term uh, studies, uh, epidemiological studies, you know, the lag time explodes is up to one week. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, so there is most of the results uh, t told us that, you know, get some time to get the inflation, the inflammation in the lung. So there is a lag time before you go to the hospital or you go to the emergency room. But the study on bronchiolitis that was extended to four weeks. Uh, after the exposure indicated that the strongest effect was at the third week. Mm -hmm. So it was much longer than six days. And this is telling, there are no other studies on this. So these are telling us that the relevant exposure may become much more earlier than the six days. And this is something that we have no replication, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I think that those types of epidemiological findings really get us to start thinking mechanistically mm -hmm. as, well, what cell must have been affected three weeks ago mm -hmm. to be able to then see this effect now? Mm -hmm. And like I said, there's a whole spectrum of half-lives in the immune system. And so one could kind of pry apart this and then test hypotheses. So that's why I think this type of meeting where you have epidemiologists and right. mechanistic scientists together can really lay out the pathway towards studying these hypotheses. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, Harish Amini from University of Copenhagen. Uh, so I have a question about, uh, you mentioned, Dr. Nadu, about uh, that uh, you have seen microplastics in uh, wildfires in California. So I, I wonder, first of all, how have you measured that? And is there any uh, study in health effects of microplastics on the immune system? Uh, sure, that is a, um, <laughs> a very good question with a lot of ambiguity at the current time. The microplastics actually have been measured through our local EPA uh, representative, which we're very thankful for. We've been working with Eurofins as well to try to get standardized methods to study microplastics in the blood and in tissues. You probably saw the most recent papers that have been published in the lung and, and blood microplastics, exactly what they all are doing and what they're potentially leading to is still a big question. But at least we 
hopefully we'll have better ways of monitoring them and testing them with vis-a-vis -vis a lot of other toxicants that are in wildfire smoke as well. So it's an unanswerable question at the current time. Hi, Ashley Turner from Cincinnati Children's. Um, HEI has talked a lot the past few days about focusing more on susceptible and vulnerable populations, so I'm, I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. Um, and I was just wondering if any of you have thought about or have done either models or human population um, studies on the potential prenatal um, exposure effects of air pollution and whether that either um, and whether that makes them more vulnerable to respiratory infections later in life um, or a decreased immune system. <clears throat> um, excellent question. Um, so obviously in terms of you know, doing exposure and controlled models, that's, that's very tricky. But I've, we've actually have a project, hopefully to be published soon, where we basically did an epidemiological an analysis looking at um, births in a birth uh, database and comparing it to childhood upper, lower, and systemic um, anti-inflammatory medication use and overlaid whether or not and to what extent and in what, what perinatal and, and prenatal and postnatal period they were exposed to potential wildfires. And so the analysis indicates that postnatal exposure or perinatal exposure in the first 12 weeks post-birth is associated with um, later in life um, medication use for upper and lower respiratory inflammatory diseases. So while that is not a direct link, it's an epidemiological link, but it certainly warrants um, additional sort of studies. The other thing that um, we can learn from is actually from our colleagues at UC Davis who have a non-human primate colony out, you know, out in the open, and that non-human primate colony is subject to any incidental wildfires. And Lisa Miller actually published, and she's still publishing studies from an incidental exposure of that colony in, I think it was 2008, 2009, but don't quote me on that, um, looking at, and there, was, there were um, uh, monkeys that were just born as well as in uterine exposures, and she's following these non-human primates and looking at later in life um, development of disease. And what she found was, especially in the female um, uh, offsprings, there seemed to be a greater incidence of developing of you know, the, the non-human primate version of asthma. So it's difficult to do this controlled in humans, but there's this incidental exposure system or exposure scenario in these sort of non-human primate colonies. Let me just add that there are a number of studies in pipeline, including funded by HEI, on birth outcomes. I mean, it wouldn't be necessarily longitudinal, you know, follow-up, but obviously, if you build those cohorts and if you um, have exposure assessment and, and other measurements early in life, you can actually follow these cohorts. So there are a number of European cohorts that are actually trying to do that. So just again, uh, look at HEI website for those studies and, uh, you know, link up to folks who are, some of them are here. So, um, having, uh, you know, representing the research committee, both Evie and I, uh, you know, I couldn't, uh, you know, um, escape the chair's prerogative uh, um, for asking uh, a provocative question. So, um, uh, for those of you who have read requests for proposals or funding announcements from NIH, you frequently notice that those funding announcements want announcement announcements want everything, and then they give you $300,000 a year. So HI is no different, right? There's always a hard budget uh, limit. Uh, and obviously, all of you in the audience and us here on the podium appreciate the complexities of the immune system and the variety of different cell types and phenotypes and uh, longitudinal designs that we need to address them, even in vitro, let alone combine the uh, translational studies together with clinical and epidemiological cohorts. So um, if I can ask uh, you know, our uh, presenters to perhaps uh, advise HEI on what would be the study design that is three-year long and reasonably funded uh, that would actually solve this whole problem. Is there such a thing? So, Kari, we'll start with you. <laughs> okay. No pressure. Uh, pressure's a privilege, I guess. That's what Billie Jean King said. Um, well, I, uh, I, as you were talking, so forgive the uh, sort of brainstorming um, James Joyce flow of consciousness here, but 
I, I think that, um, I think what would be highly, at least to me, a best buy, as it were, to, to get the most out of any given investment in, in studies, is to try to understand um, the linkage between features that have been highly epidemiologically studied to be able to further justify a given policy or an outcome. And so what I'd love to be able to see funded is implementation science on whether or not a city being using mostly transportation that is compl completely electric being studied before and after. Yeah. And to what extent did that help an immediate change in their asthma outputs, immune outputs, and then study them long term to look at mental health and to look at other issues like cardiovascular. So that's longer than three years, I know, and I'm hoping the person will get <laughs> renewed funding. Um, but importantly, I, I think implementation science is key, that we should look at mitigation features, either electrification of a city before and after, and use some of the same tools that we've been all talking about today and showing. And the other potential is to look at an adaptation technique for example, using air filters in a specific built environment and to see to what extent that changed outcomes. And then finally, to link something and to give some funding to our fellow multidisciplinary uh, <laughs> professors in economics and to do some cost-benefit analysis of that change, either adaptation or mitigation. So that's gonna be a, a big packed <laughs> grant, um, but I, I hope that that would be possible. All right, um, okay, I definitely want to be part of whatever you're doing there. Um, at 300,000. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so one thing that I think could be done even for, for $300,000 that could actually provide hours of entertainment for years to come <laughs> is to develop a um, biorepository of samples that are collected in the field and data that's collected in the field from multiple sites. There's many mechanisms now, and I don't know how many of you guys have been part of a COVID study. We all know now how to swab our own noses. Uh, we, can, we can collect these samples, and actually, Storm, you don't need to come into a lab. You basically just swap, swap your nose. I was part of a study where I collected my own blood. Uh, not, not I, I, I would faint, but it's basically like a small little attachment. So there's many sort of home um, collection tools available now, so where people, free range humans can be studied <laughs> all over the United States and using um, apps, using social media to understand other sort of questionnaires and sort of building the exposure um, assessment but also collecting longitudinal, these biological samples and storing them with a the proper data management in a central HEI biorepository which then provides the basis for subsequent studies uh, for, for other applications. So basically, building the tools for many studies for years to come. That is something that I think could be done even with $300,000. Okay, Ivan, I think I have two suggestions for HEI. The first one is the simplest one. Uh, uh, HEI has already funded the COVID-19 studies these studies are, uh, uh, are up to 2021 before the vaccination. We need to study the interaction between the vaccination, uh, the infections, and, and air pollution. And this is an opportunity that we have but it's very important scientifically. The second, if you give some money, I think we should uh, focus to susceptible populations, like uh, people with asthma, both children and, and adults, and people with COPD, and get a longitudinal study with measurement of both the infection, the type of infections, and, and uh, as the colleague is, has been suggesting, some markers of the immune status. Uh, this is something that is lacking in a way, and we also lack simple surrogates for uh, depressed uh, immune status. So, so this is something that we need to, we cannot study, you know, thousands of people with, uh, with uh, biomarkers, but we can find very simple uh, surrogates questions. 
Thank you, and I think that all of you agree that uh, really exposure scientists and epidemiologists, uh, you know, as they, as you conceive uh, new studies, new cohorts, and longitudinal, uh, then hopefully you heard loud and clear that please talk to your colleagues in molecular biology and molecular epidemiology and mechanistic toxicology as you design these studies so you can actually think of collecting biological specimens at the right time and the right condition and the right, um, you know, tissue uh, to enable this future research, even if perhaps you don't have the funds to actually analyze all that. So I think all of, our, all of us will um, uh, agree to this collaboration. And again, I'd like to, you know, thank all of you for presenting your respective uh, areas of expertise. And to conclude, I'd like to pass the microphone back to my co-chair, uh, Professor Samoli, to say uh, a few concluding remarks. So thank you all. I think part of the dis later discussion now has been, uh, is been trying to be addressed by running exposomic, exposome studies, both in US and Europe, trying to combine all this needed interdisciplinary expertise to answer current questions. And thank you for uh, producing uh, interesting thoughts about the next steps in our uh, research. So I would like everybody to welcome to thank our discussants and conclude the session for today.